Welcome back. Um, this video is a quick addendum to the previous one. Um, we spent quite a lot of time on theorem 4.1, essentially proving this thing, um, which is a relatively straightforward theorem about when it is that a to the i can be equal to a to the j. And we discovered that it um, depends on whether a has finite or infinite order. If it's got infinite order, then a to the i equals a to the j means that i equals j. And if it's got finite order, then an equivalent statement is that i minus j is a multiple of n. So I just wanted to st state a few corollaries to this as just the only thing we're going to do in this video. Um, so a corollary, just in case you haven't met that word before, a corollary is simply a small result that follows from a larger theorem. So it's really like a theorem, but in a sense it's kind of small because it follows directly from the theorem which is stated. So the first of these corollaries, um, so we'll have number one. So corollaries always apply to the theorem before it. So the first corollary is that the order of an element A is the same as the order of the cyclic subgroup that it generates. Okay, and we can see that from this one here. The order, remember the order of the element is the lowest integer that gives us the identity when we take the power of a to that integer. Um, so we can see that there are exactly n things in this cyclic group, and so it's the order of that cyclic group is the same of the order as the order of a itself. Which makes sense of why it is that both of those things are called order, even though on the face of it they're quite different um, statements. So the second corollary is uh, we let A have order N. Then if A to the K equals E, then, then N divides Okay. okay, so this should, this is the one that says that if a to the power of an integer is the identity, then it's a multiple of the order. Okay, and how do we use that? How do we treat that as a corollary from our theorem? Well, we can state it in this way, a to the k equals a to the 0. So I'm using this statement here with um, k and 0 instead of i and j. This implies uh, n divides k minus 0. Okay, and a couple of other little notes that we can make as a result of this work. A multiplication in a cyclic group is the same as addition with an a mod n. Okay, so if i plus j, i.e. if i plus j equals k mod n, then a to the i, if I multiply two corresponding things, I'll get a to the k if order of a is n. Okay, so notice that when we form a cyclic group and we multiply two elements together like we're doing here, then we just get the sum of their exponents mod n. Um, same, it, it works exactly the same way as if we were in Zn, we add modulo n. Okay, and the last thing we'll note, um, same thing applies for an infinite group. If A has infinite order, then it behaves just like the integers, a to the i, a to the j equals a to the i plus j, just like addition in z. Okay, so we'll show later on in the course that that um, cyclic groups and integers, whether it's integers mod n or just integers, are essentially the same thing because the group operation works the same way. Um, when we take a cyclic group and we compose two elements together, then they either add mod n, if we've got a finite order element, that's this one here, or alternatively they add the normal way if our element has infinite order, so it's just like we're in the integers. Okay, so that's a little postscript to the previous video. Um, the next one we'll dive in with another theorem and some corollaries uh, where it starts to get a bit, get a bit more interesting.